Hello, my name is Christy Carey Miller. This virtual workshop is designed to give you some creative ideas and ways to teach a song to your upper elementary, middle school, or uh, early high school choirs. Uh, as a middle school teacher myself, I am always looking for innovative and creative ways to teach a song to my students. If I, I find that if I do the same steps each and every time, then they kind of know what's going to happen and they don't pay as close of attention as if I change it up a bit. Now, I'm fairly certain that uh, you will discover that you already do these same steps that I do or ideas, but maybe you've forgotten about them or maybe they're similar to what you've done or maybe you've never heard about them before. I, I know as teachers, that's how we do it, right? We grab somebody else's idea, we switch it around with the way we would do it, and then we use it in our classroom with our style. So I hope that I can offer you some uh, new approaches to an old way of learning. Um, now, rote singing, of course, is a way to learn a song. In fact, we've learned uh, our folk songs through oral tradition. That means I sing it, and you sing it back. And although this does play a part in our learning at different times as we're teaching songs, uh, sometimes my students find this to be tedious and long, and it really doesn't stretch their musicianship. It doesn't uh, enhance what I need for them to do. So hopefully you will discover some ideas today that will help you in this process. For starters, I think it's very important that the first step that you use in teaching a song to your singers is for you to learn the music and not just hear it, but really get it into your bones. I know a lot of times as I'm driving to and from school, I may have the songs that I'll be teaching my students uh, in a recording so that I can listen to them in the car to kind of get them that way. And then once I've heard it and know where I'm going melodically, I'll lay out the music and I'll try to look for what I feel is important in that particular uh, piece. Maybe it's the text. Maybe it's a rhythm or rhythmic element. Maybe it's uh, uh, the melody itself, how it sings. Maybe it's the dynamics or articulation. Maybe it's the form. It doesn't matter. I try to find something different in each piece that I can really bring out so that the singers can hear it. And then, you know what? Make sure you look up any words in the text or even in the uh, music language that's uh, maybe something you don't understand. If you're not 100% certain, because you know that just as soon as the kids get that music in their hand, they're going to ask you about that word. And you look a whole lot smarter if you know what that word means. So I know I've been caught sort of behind on that part, but I think that's really, really important. Once you know this music and you have figured out through an analysis exactly what you're wanting to teach, now you're ready to begin. First of all, I cannot stress to you enough how important it is that students hear the music before they ever start learning. I think that's essential. Um, to start this process, most of the time, I will give my students the music to hold in their hands. And then once they've got the music in their hands, I've got to hook them into wanting to learn it. Um, so somehow I've got to grab their attention. Maybe it's the text of the song. Maybe it's information about the song. Uh, maybe it's why this song is important to you. Or maybe you've been to a workshop and heard the composer or arranger talking about the piece and something that's unusual or different about it. But something's got to grab their attention so they're motivated to learn. But then that's what I love about the Discovery Series. On the inside cover of each song, there's an information that talks about the song, either teaching or performance suggestions, but most of the time, information about the song itself or the composer or the lyrics. This has really helped to engage my students in the opening process. Now that I've grabbed their attention, it's time for them to hear the song. Now, in this first time through, we may just listen to it once, but throughout the course of learning it, they're going to hear it several more times. I'm going to give you some steps for that. But I really cannot stress how much I believe in ear training as far as uh, music learning goes. 
ear training is as important to me as the vocal training. I tell my students all the time, you know, when you're born, you don't just pop out and say, yo, ma, dad, hey, how you doing? Thanks for having me. No, instead, they spend a whole year looking at you in your face and saying, say mama, mama, dada, say mama. And finally, after hearing it over and over, you're able to repeat it. So learning music is very similar to that same thing. One easy way for students to start the process of hearing the music is to play the recording and ask them to finger point the words or the notes as they are listening. Um, I like this process because I can find out who's following and who's struggling. Uh, with that said, make sure that they are aware of all of the music road signs and things that are found in this music. If there's a lot of complicated road signs in a song, we might just read through the uh, text in rhythm if possible, and I give them direction on where to turn and go to as they are uh, following along, and then we'll listen to the music as I have them finger point. Uh, make sure that you include rehearsal marks as you're teaching them about those music road signs, as that's really going to help you later on in getting to much needed rehearsal spots in a quick and easy manner. After they've listened to this music, uh, we try to spend time talking about it. it might be this, what's the style? We might talk about the style or the modality, or we might talk about the text. Or if they have any questions about the lyrics, I have them ask that at that time. One thing I do not let them say to me is, I don't like it. Because I tell them they cannot judge a song until after they've performed it. Um, I'm reminded often, and I tell them how many times I've been in the car and I'm listening to the radio and a new song comes on. And I'm thinking, I'm not really crazy about that song. But then I hear it again the second time, and I'm thinking, well, yeah, it's not as bad as I thought. And then the third time the song comes in, I'm singing along with it. And then the fourth time, I'm the one that called it in. So repetition and hearing it over and over again makes the ear grow fonder. A fun way to introduce a song by listening, or if they've heard it on another day, is to have them move to the recording to identify the form. Uh, there have been times that I have had them warm their bodies up at the beginning of the class by doing this. And again, if they've heard the song before, they're going to start liking it better. Here's an example of a song I wrote with John Jacobson, with which I've had my students warm up. Uh, you can see and hear from this first part, they can easily do one set of movements. Maybe it's alternately stretching your arms to the right uh, and left or cross your body, or maybe overhead to the right or left. begins, you could have them alternately reach forward with the right, then left, or reach up, then out. You get the idea. Another fun way to have them listen to the music is to uh, play a song like this last one. This is an upbeat song, and have them play the freeze game. Everybody knows how to play the freeze game. Uh, sometimes I'll have my students walk to the music, or maybe if they want to dance to it, they can dance to it or move to it somehow. But when the music stops, they freeze and they stay in a frozen position until the music takes up again. This works better for my younger kids, but they would do it every day if I would let them. And of course, they would always want to play a game with it. If I saw anybody moving beyond the music when it was stopped, then they were out. So you know how that goes. Another great way for them to hear the music is to find this piece uh, on YouTube that's being performed by a choir. This really was an invaluable tool for me in more than just the listening manner. In another way, uh, several years ago when I was looking up uh, a song on YouTube that I wanted to teach my singers. 
And it just so happened that I found a recording of, it was obviously a parent who was getting a close-up shot of their child. And it was a small section of singers, so we got a really close-up view of what was going on. Now, um, as my students are watching this, they noticed that there was one girl on the risers, and she just kept yawning. And somebody laughed about that. And then they noticed another girl that was playing with her hair like this. And then there was a third girl that had a cold, so she kept rubbing her nose with uh, tissue. It was kind of funny because they just were so appalled by this distracting behavior behind these uh, performers. And I reminded them that that's why I'm constantly uh, having them put their hands to their side and stay focused. In fact, later on in the year, as it went by, we were getting ready for our performances. Uh, all I had to do was say something about, hey, hair girl, or tissue boy or uh, yawner, and they knew exactly what I was talking about. Now, in that respect, we also took time to listen to the choir and uh, do some constructive listening on what things they could do better or what things they were doing better. We also went back and looked at singers that were paying attention and focused on how much better it came across. So that was a really fun way for them to hear that song again. Okay, now they've heard the song maybe several times, and it's time to teach it. Now, in the perfect world, your students would open up the music and they would start singing the notes with solfege and hand signs and perfect rhythm. But I have to tell you in my classroom, that's not gonna happen. Although we'll probably find small segments of music where we can do that, and I'm not taking away from that element of teaching, it's important, and that is their ultimate goal, is to be able to get to that spot Right now in their learning process, we got to take it a little bit slower. So if I'm going to start by having them learn the melody or hearing that in their head with the, the rhythm, I will uh, play a game that I love called Seek and Find. And with this, they're going to open up their music. And by the way, if I'm going to play this game with them, usually I try to find a spot in the music that is unison, where uh, they were just going to learn the same notes. Everybody's going to learn the same notes so they can follow their part or not. Um, or you might just have them follow those part one line or part two line, regardless. So what they're going to do is take the music and they're going to open it up and they're going to uh, follow along as I play the melodic line. I'll have my accompanist play the part. And then I'll tell them that uh, we're going to stop randomly and they need to identify the word or part of word, the word uh, where we stopped. After we've done that, we'll go back. Let's play this game a little bit. We're going to use the song uh, My Soul is Awakened, which is an arrangement and a piece that I did from an Anne Bronte uh, poem. So you can see the music. I'm going to just play uh, any part because it's unison here. And uh, we're going to identify the word that we stopped on, or part of the word. Are you ready? Here we go. And of course, they raise their hand. And it's awake, the word wakened from the word wake from wakened at measure 10. And a lot of times I'll have them identify the measure also. Now I'm going to go back to the beginning. All right, that's the word spear, spirit at measure 11. I go back to the beginning. ing of soaring. Right, good. I go back to the beginning. That's right. And care. On a different day, after they've heard this song or they've started to learn it, I might play a different form of seek and find. I'll have them open up the music, we'll re look at the part that we've learned, and then I will maybe sing a measure or part of the phrase, and they have to identify where that is in the music. And once they've done that, then we sing it together. If there's an interesting motif that you can find in the music, um, that might be what you're going to want your students to listen for. Maybe it's a melodic motif, maybe it's rhythmic, uh, maybe it's just a combination of both. But uh, what I have them do is I'm going to 
let them listen to that motif and then we'll play through the music or have a recording play through and they would raise their hand each time they heard the motif occur. I'm going to use this example of home. This is a, a new piece of mine. And I want you to listen to this rhythmic motif. Now, I would do this for my students. I would clap it by speaking the rhythm syllables first. One, two, and three, four. And then I would have them repeat that to me. Then I would do it again without the rhythm syllables. And ask them to repeat it back. Now, we're going to follow and listen to this music. Actually, we're not going to follow. We're just going to listen to this music. And I want you to raise your hand each time you hear this motif happening. How many times did you hear it? If you said 11, then you're right. At this point, I'd have them open up the music. And each time the motif happens in a song, I would have them clap that motif with the music. So, it's another fun idea. When teaching that melody, uh, we spend a lot of time talking about the pitches. Uh, maybe we'll identify on a page where the highest pitch is, where the lowest pitch is, we talk about the melodic direction. Uh, they're so focused on text and lyrics when they're first starting that they forget there's another element to the song, and that's the notes. Um, so I will explain or remind them that melodic direction is like connect the dots. So if I were to take a pencil and draw a line from one note head to the next and then look at the form of the lines. What does my line look like? Is it going up? Is it coming down? Is it staying the same? Up and down? That's your melodic direction. So we pay attention to that. So as they're singing, they will also start focusing on that. In addition, so many composers do such a great job of marrying the text with the melody. So we will talk about why did this composer add these rests at the certain spot? Why does the melody go here up in the air where it says um, the word high? Why does it go down when it says um, in the valley, down in the valley? Things like that. Once they take note of those things, it really makes them feel like they're a lot smarter and they like those parts better. Generally, if I ask questions about the song later, they will make references to things like that. Um, once the melody also has been heard and learned, it's fun for me to sing a line and, have, and leave out a word and then have them fill in the word at the end that's missing so they've heard it enough time. A call and response is always good, especially if you've got one of those songs where phrases one and three are identical melodically, maybe not with words, but... Uh, they are identical pitch wise and then two and four is different I might ask them to sing phrases one and three and I would sing two and four and then we would switch and uh, they would sing two and four and I would sing one and three since rhythm is sort of the backbone of a song don't ever hesitate to start off by teaching the rhythm first um, one way is to 
clap the rhythm and have them clap it back to you and measure, measure maybe two measure phrases, four measure phrases. Really, it's better if they're looking at the music as they're doing that. But sometimes you might have a situation where you can do it without. Um, I sometimes have my students write the rhythm in. I don't do this for the entire song, maybe just a section of it, maybe the chorus part. And then once they've written the rhythm in, I'll have them pat the rhythm as they rhythm speak through the song. Then we'll go back and rhythm uh, read the text. So those are important spots. If there's a song that has a lot of rests in it, and I'm going to use this example because I love this song anyway, it's a Jim Papoulis piece called I Ask for One Day. And it has an enormous amount of rest that he put there for a reason. Uh, but it's not necessarily rests that they need for breathing. So I need to make them aware of where those rests are. I will have them uh, listen to this music and flick the page of their music each time the rests occurs. So let's, let's do that. We're going to look at this song, I Asked for One Day. So find a piece of paper that you can um, use for flicking or a person, if you don't like them, you can flick them next to you. And uh, as you're listening to this music, just flick the spot where um, the rests occur. Okay, now once they've learned uh, the song or they find out where those rests are, we'll go back and sing that part, making sure that they uh, focus on the rests this time through. I had a friend show me this next activity that I love using. Um, it's, it needs to be used with fairly easy rhythms. It's called rhythm cups. And uh, so what we do is we start with a cup for each student. And I teach them that quarter notes are just a tap on their lap or their folders or whatever you've got a hard surface for. The quarter notes are a tap. Half notes are a tap, slide. Dotted halves are tap, slide, slide. Whole notes, tap, slide, slide, slide. Eighth notes are tap and tap. Up, tap. Those are eighth notes. Uh, once they understand the rhythm, sometimes I'll write a few of those rhythms from the song on the board. My measure rhythms will practice. Then we'll open up the music slowly. We'll go through the song and use our rhythm cups to tap the rhythm. Sometimes I'll have two people at a time. One holds some music while the other one taps and then they switch parts. Once that's learned, or at least they've gone through it, then we will play the accompaniment. Now, if you've got a red, or not red, you can have any color. If you've got a cup handy, get it out. We're going to try this to uh, arrangement I did of Rocky Top, just a portion of it. And let's see if you can uh, tap the rhythm with your cup. Um, there is a dotted quarter eighth note in this piece, so that would be tap and up, tap, tap. So you'll just need to watch out for that in the song. Okay, here we go. Other 
close to Rocky by far. That's why all the folks on Rocky Top get their corn from the jar. Rocky Top, you'll always be home, sweet home to me. Good old Rocky Top, Rocky Top, Tennessee. Okay, your students are going to have a lot of fun with this learning the song in this manner and they should get it but if they don't yeah i guess you could just take your little red solo cup and go drown your sorrows by the way this idea that you just used and many other great ideas for your young and developing choirs can be found in a book that i co-wrote with this friend called quick starts for young choirs it's a book that's just got tons of ideas like this and many others including movement, warm-up ideas, tension breakers, music games, theory assignment ideas, ear training, solfege. There's just an amazing amount of things you will find useful and fun for your developing choirs. So take a look. Teaching concepts as you're working through the songs is really important for those kiddos. I try to find at least three concepts or no more than three concepts that I'm going to focus on for that piece. Obviously, it's going to have a lot more, but maybe there are three obvious ones that need to be addressed. Uh, we're going to work on those three or talk about those three concepts every time we come up with that song. Um, when it's This works in my favor because when it's time for a concert and a student misses for whatever reason, I can uh, ask them for their makeup assignment to discuss the three concepts that we discussed in each of those pieces as we were learning them. Um, now, let's talk about this concept. Let's say that you're working, one of the concepts is dynamics, and there are a lot of dynamic changes in a song. Uh, I love to have my kids stand up for the fortes, any forte, and sit down for the pianos, any piano. Um, and if there's any crescendos, they will gradually stand up. And if there are any diminuendos, they gradually sit down. So we're going to try that with a song. Uh, this is a piece that I love from Amy Burnan called The Bird with One Wing. So you're going to uh, stand up on the pianos and uh, sit down on the fortes. And if you see any crescendos or diminuendos, Okay, wasn't that fun? Plus, well, I don't know about you, but every once in a while my watch tells me that I need to stand, so it was good for your health. If articulation is important in the music, then have your students do something kinesthetically uh, to identify those places in the song. Uh, for staccatos, I have them touch an iron. And by the way, a lot of kids don't know what an iron is anymore. <laughs> Either do I. Touch an iron for the staccatos. I'll have them paint the sky for legatos. Uh, for um, mercados, I'll have them punch the air. For tenudos, I may have them knead the bread. Something where they understand it's a little different approach to that note when they get there. Okay, we're going to try this a little bit. 
Uh, let's do this on Kinberg's piece entitled Join the Song. We're only going to focus on marcados at this time because there's more than that in this piece. And sometimes he uses marcados with staccatos and tenudos, but just on the marcados. And as you follow along, I want you to punch the air or something other than a human for each marcado you see. Feel free to sing along. So there's your aerobics for the day. If I'm working with a foreign language piece, or if I have a piece that has difficult lyrics to remember, I like to use another idea that I have from my Quick Starts book. Um, what you're going to do is take the difficult section and divide the words up uh, into either measures or individual words, depending upon what the situation is, and write those words or sections on uh, 8 by 10 inch paper. Um, then you're going to take those papers and hand them out to students randomly. They're going to come to the front of the room and stand in an order, not in any particular order. It's up to the class to try to put those students with those words in the correct uh, text order, lyric order. Once they're in the right order, then you can have the students sing through uh, that part of the song or what you're displaying. Um, randomly select a student to lower their paper so it's no longer visible, but continue to sing through the uh, song again with those same lyrics. Continue to add more papers down until none of the papers are showing and they're able to sing through the entire line uh, without any text. Great idea. Identifying mistakes in a song is a really great way for students to engage in the music learning. I usually do this after they're pretty familiar with the piece. Uh, what I will do is ask my accompanist to play through a melody uh, of a section of the song and she can play the wrong rhythm or a wrong note or maybe I sing through the song and I play I sing the wrong rhythm or note or word, maybe I insert the wrong word. But the point is the students have to identify where the mistake or mistakes happen and then what I did or what she did wrong uh, as, as that should have been done a different way. What happened musically that was incorrect. So we're going to try this with a piece of mine that I did this year called When the Boat Comes In. So I'm going to play through and sing this little section and you need to tell me where the mistakes happen. Here we go. Ready? Dance to your daddy, sing to your mommy, dance to your daddy, my little man. You shall have a fishy on a little dish. You shall have a fishy when the boat comes in. So did you find them? That's right. Measures 12 and 16. And if selfish is something you use in your classroom or whatever sight reading method you use, always incorporate it into one part of a song or several songs. Uh, it's the healthiest way for your singers to understand the music and grow in their musicianship and it's like it's like feeding them. That's the only way they're going to ever learn to eat on their own. Uh, if you're interested in songs that use some solfege incorporated into the lyrics, I have a bunch of them I've written. Take a look at these. There's Solfege Santa, Solfege Christmas, Solfege Samba, Solfege Symphony, and Solfege Mambo. Thank you for taking the time to watch this video today. I hope you've learned something. I know that my dogs have. They've learned a lot. They've been howling. But I hope you've found something new to use in your classroom next year, no matter what it may look like. Um, stay safe. Stay germ-free. Take care.